let me try to sketch out for you what my part in this conference will look like tonight, tomorrow, and Sunday so that you can see how things fit together or at least are intended to. Tonight, I want to make a case that the Bible is the greatest book in the world. No competitors, really. Sunday morning, I want to make a case that Romans 8 is the greatest chapter in the Bible. And in between, with the help of the screen and the text and the pen, unpack as many of these glories from Romans 8 as we can and work inductively to the big conclusion of Sunday morning. So that's, that's the plan. So three sessions in Romans 8 tomorrow and the big climax of why it's the greatest on Sunday morning. But tonight, uh, the book. The book. This. The greatest book in the world. So my, my aim in this message is to awaken and deepen and intensify your love for the Bible as a divine gift that is absolutely essential, indispensable in accomplishing God's ultimate purpose in the universe. Namely, that he would be supremely glorified in the white-hot intensity of the everlasting joy of his redeemed people in himself through Jesus Christ. The title of the message is Scripture, the Kindling of Christian Hedonism. And it has two parts. The first part will attempt to answer what is Christian hedonism from the Bible. And the second part will attempt to explain how the Bible is indispensable in accomplishing the ultimate goals of God in the world, which are the same as the goals of Christian hedonism. So part one, what is Christian hedonism? Christian hedonism is a way of life that seeks at all times to maximize the intensity and the duration of our pleasure in God. A quest that is shaped by and based on two convictions. First, that the pleasure of greatest intensity and greatest duration is found only in God through Jesus Christ. And the second conviction is that the reason God set it up that way is because he is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So, through Christ then, we find maximum joy in God and God receives maximum glory in us as we find our maximum joy in Him. That's the meaning of Christian hedonism. Four clarifications. So this will take half the message to clarify those. I was reading the other day a pretty lengthy critique of Christian hedonism given me by a pastor in Britain that is circulated there among people who find it attractive and to try to show it's got problems. So, you don't know what those are, but these are answers to them. (laughs) Some of them anyway. Clarification number one. Let's clarify the relationship between the experience of joy and the object of joy. Very complicated, philosophical sounding, so buckle up for about five minutes on this one. I did not say in my definition that Christian hedonism seeks maximum pleasure. 
I said it seeks to maximize the intensity and the duration of pleasure in God. The wording may sound like a small difference to you. Here's why it matters. When some people hear the term seek maximum pleasure, they think that pleasure is the object sought. The object sought when in fact pleasure is the experience of the object sought. It's a category confusion to equate pleasure with what pleasure enjoys. So let's push into this clarification for a moment. Let me do it with a denial and an affirmation. I deny that Christian hedonism makes a God out of pleasure. And I affirm that we all make a God out of whatever we take most pleasure in. That's our God. In other words, Christian hedonism affirms there is no enjoyment of something without the something. The living act of enjoying something is never the something which is being enjoyed. It is not possible to delight in the living act of delighting during the authentic act of delighting. Any more than it is possible to hear the act of hearing or taste the act of tasting or smell the act of smelling or touch the act of touching. You can't enjoy the act of enjoying something while fully enjoying that something. The organ of hearing is not designed to hear hearing. It's designed to hear sounds. And the organ of joy is designed to enjoy objects of joy, not joy. Joy is the act of enjoying something. And that's your God, whatever you find most joy in. Let's take music as an example. Suppose you are experiencing an authentic pleasure in a piece of music. It's a good thing. A favorite song. And in that moment of authentic enjoying or pleasure, you're not thinking about authentic pleasure. Your mind is fixed, taken into the music. And in the split second, when you become aware that you are enjoying this music, you lose it. You lose the authentic, engaged, fully there enjoyment of the music when you're standing outside yourself and trying to enjoy the enjoyment of that music. It destroys authentic joy in the object of joy. What you do at that moment, perhaps, is enjoy the idea of enjoying music or the memory of enjoying the music. That's possible. Oh, yes. We can enjoy ideas of enjoyment you can enjoy an idea of anything. Calvinism. The deity of Christ. You, you can enjoy the idea of a reality without knowing or loving the reality. The idea is your God. Not the object. 
The moment of authentic delight, in that moment of authentic delight, you are delighting in something other than delighting. In the moment of authentic pleasure, you are taking pleasure in something other than the pleasure. And in the moment of authentic worship, you are worshiping something other than the act of worshiping. That's what I mean by the denial. Christian hedonism does not make a God out of pleasure. It affirms we all make a God out of what we take most pleasure in. That's clarification number one, and it might be helpful just to put a few passages of Scripture under it. Matthew 10, 37, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me, Jesus says, is not worthy of me. That's pretty shocking. The kind of love he has in mind there is not need-meeting love. Jesus didn't come into the world to be served, but to serve and lay down his life for many. We don't love Jesus by meeting his needs. So what's he talking about? He's talking about like me, delight in me, treasure me, embrace me, be satisfied in me. If you love your parents or children or spouse that way more than me, they are your God and you're not worthy of me, he said. That's what he said. Paul responds to that summons like this in Philippians 3.8. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. If you love anything more, if you find anything more valuable, more precious, a greater treasure, a stronger, deeper, more abiding satisfaction, you belittle Jesus. You're not worthy of me. God said the same thing in Jeremiah 2. 9, verse 23 to 24. Let the wise man boast in his wisdom. I'm sorry, I left out a knot. That's pretty important. <laughs> Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. You make a God out of wisdom, might, and riches when you exult in them, boast in them, find them to be more precious, more desirable than God. They are your God. So, Christian hedonism seeks always, at all times, to maximize the intensity and the duration of our pleasure in God. And that intensity and that duration is not our God, it is the evidence of how valuable He is. That's clarification, number one. Number two, we need to clarify um, this maximum intensity, maximum duration of our pleasure in God by saying it matters infinitely, it matters infinitely. I don't think Christian hedonism is peripheral or icing on the cake of Christianity. I think it is Christianity. If, let's, let's put it starkly, if you could offer me a pleasure more intense, deeper, higher, fuller, and longer 
then the pleasure I may have in God, I would take it. And I asked the Lord this afternoon if I could say that. In fact, I asked him weeks ago if I could say that. And I checked in again this afternoon. And he smiled. And he's smiling right now on me. Because he knows that for me to say, if there is a pleasure more intense, more long and lasting than what is in God, go for it, is a way that John Piper has before the face of God saying, not a chance. You are it. Full and lasting forever in your presence is joy. There is no competitor. That's what John Piper's saying. God knows that. That's why he's smiling. He is magnified. He's always smiling when we magnify him. He's magnified by saying, you got a pleasure that will be 99.9% as good as what God gives and lasts 80 million years and then stops? You got that to offer me my answer? Not interested. That word stop terrifies me. 100% forever or I'm not interested. Psalm 1611, you have shown us the path of life in your presence is fullness, fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures, not for 800 million ages of millennia, but forever. And it grows, but that's another conference. (laughs) That's clarification number two. It's really important, and he's the only source. Clarification number three on the definition of Christian hedonism is this issue that God designed the world this way, that is, for him to be the supreme satisfaction of our souls. He designed the world that way. He could have created it another way. He designed the world that way precisely because he is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. He loves his glory. It is his supreme value. And I am so thankful. When I first saw this years ago, I just wanted to weep for joy. That not only did I not have to choose between my joy and his glory, I dare not. It's blasphemy to choose. It's blasphemy to try to choose my supreme happiness over God's supreme glory. That's a blasphemous denial that only in God can my joy be found. Almost everybody would agree with that. But the other side, many people choke on. It is blasphemy to try to glorify God without the pursuit of supreme pleasure in Him. Because that's a blasphemous denial that my heart's affections are not essential to worship. A denial that my affections For God, my treasuring God, delighting in God, being satisfied in God. My affections for God are not essential for making much of God. That's a blasphemous denial. They are. Jesus Jesus said, Matthew 15, This people honors me with their lips. 
Praise you, praise you, praise you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. This people honors me with their lips. Their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. Vain, empty, zero worship is not true worship. That is, he isn't honored. He isn't shown to be worthy if we are saying, praying, singing truth while our heart is at home. Therefore, it's blasphemy to say we should make it an aim to glorify God in life while not pursuing the engagement of our whole heart in loving and delighting and being satisfied in him as though that were a matter of indifference when Jesus said your worship is zero without it? God has created the universe in which he is glorified in our being satisfied in him. We need not, we dare not choose between our joy in God and his glory in us. Dare not. Paul said, it is my eager expectation and hope that Christ would be magnified. I love that Greek word, megalunthesetai. That's a great sound. You can hear mega in it at least. Magnified. It is my eager hope and expectation that Christ would be magnified in my body whether I live or whether I die. And then he added, for to me to die is gain. And then he explained why, because to die is to go to be with Christ, which means Christ is magnified most in Paul's dying when he finds Christ so satisfied in, so satisfying in dying that it is gain at the loss of everything. That magnifies Christ. So my third clarification is yes, God, Christ, they are most magnified in us when we are most satisfied in them, especially in moments of suffering and death. Which is why it's a strange irony that when I began to write about this in the 70s, you remember the 70s? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> the, the first reaction was, that's just another middle-class American prosperity voice. When in fact, it destroys all of it. Because it says, all your effort to find your pleasure in prosperity and make Jesus a means to that end is idolatry. Christ isn't magnified when you get your Cadillacs by following him. Christ is magnified when you die following him and say, gain. Clarification number four. The effort to maximize the intensity and the duration of, of your pleasure in God may cost you your life. Flannery O'Connor, novelist, said, picture me with my ground teeth stalking joy, fully armed too, for it is a highly dangerous quest. Indeed it is, Mark 8. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses it for my sake will gain it forever. 
In other words, it may cost you your life to experience Christ as fully gain, which is what Jesus meant you should do. If they persecuted you, they will persecute, I'm sorry, if they persecuted me, Jesus said, they will persecute you, John 15. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? Matthew 10. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, 2 Timothy 3. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God, Acts 14. What son is there whom his father does not discipline? For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. What do all those texts teach? They all teach that our main disease is preferring other things to God and God's great physician therapy is to knock as many of those other things out from under us as he must to get us to rely wholly on him, otherwise known as suffering. If you are a child who has never been disciplined, you are a bastard. Hebrews 12. You're not a child. He disciplines his children. He disciplines his children. That is, they suffer. Because our main disease is that I love other than God. God knows that. It's the way every human being is wired on the planet. I love everything more than I love God. And he has a way, he has a way to destroy those things. Don't make him. When you come to Christ, the temple of your soul is filled with idols. And the smashing of those idols by the new Lord of the temple will be a lifelong experience of happy pain. Whatever gain I had, and he had many, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ so that God wouldn't have to yank them away. I held on. God knows what he's doing in your losses. He knows what he's doing. He's a good doctor. He knows what he's doing in your losses. Trust him. If you turn against him, in those moments, it's like turning against your surgeon, your savior, your lover, the only hope of everlasting joy. End of four clarifications, end of part one. Christian hedonism is a vision of life and of God that is devoted all the time to maximizing the intensity and the duration of our pleasure in God based on the conviction that it can't be found anywhere but in God and He is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in Him so that you never have to choose between His glory and your joy. Indeed, you dare not choose if your joy is in God. Part two, what is the role of Scripture in the achievement of the ultimate goal of God in creation? So this sermon really is about the Bible. Now we get there. But we had to set that up because here's how I'm going to define the ultimate goal of God in the universe. Why did he make the universe? Why does Minneapolis exist? Why does this building exist? Why do you exist? Your family, your churches, your schools? Why does it all exist? There's an answer for that in the Bible. The ultimate aim of God in creation is that he would be maximally glorified in the white-hot intensity of the everlasting joy 
of his people as they experience him as their supreme treasure. In a broken world now, in a perfect world later. Let me say it again. The ultimate aim of God in creating the universe and sustaining the universe and redeeming the universe is that he would be maximally glorified in the white-hot intensity of the everlasting joy of his redeemed people in himself as they experience him as the supreme treasure in their lives in a broken world and then in a perfect world. Oh, how many things, how many books need to be written to unpack that statement. For example, two sermons I'm not going to give, or books that I won't write, but one I did. We'd have to clarify at this moment about the purpose of God in the universe, that this white-hot intensity in the everlasting joy of his people must be and will be a people with total global ethnic and racial diversity and unity. It will be a redeemed people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation <clears throat> because God has ordained, God has ordained that his glory can only receive its fullest display through the unified, diverse, intense, lasting joy of his redeemed people. That's a book that I, I tried to write. Here's another one that would take a conference. I said that his goal is that we find, he find his glory in the white hot intensity of his people's joy in him as they experience him as their supreme treasure in and through a broken, imperfect world and then a perfect one, which means somebody's got to write a book about how you, without committing idolatry, enjoy God in the enjoyment of pizza or sex in marriage, or music, or clouds, or babies. God didn't create the world merely as potential idols. He created the world as mediators of authentic, non-idolatrous joy in himself, in and through the enjoyment of what he made. And that book, too, has been written. Joe Rigney wrote it. It'll be available in January. It's a good book. Order it at Amazon. <laughs> now, because it's, it's got a little blue bar, not an orange bar, whatever that other color is. That's not what we're going to talk about. Those are the two sermons I'm not giving. Here's what we are going to finish up with. The second half of this message, don't want to clue you, we're not done yet. We've got another halfway to go. What we will tackle here now in this second half is this ultimate goal of God, being maximally glorified in the white hot intensity of the enjoyment of the people of God in God as they enjoy Him in and through the broken and then perfected world. What, what we're going to do with that is to argue that this cannot be fulfilled. This aim of God cannot be fulfilled without the Bible. If the Bible goes, the universe is over in its God-intended purpose. That's the rest of the message. Without this book, God will not, has ordained, cannot complete the purpose for which he made the world, which makes this the most important book in the world. 
because God is the most important person in the world and his purposes are the most important purposes in the world and those purposes cannot be achieved without the book. That's what we're going to try to spend the rest of our time arguing. Nothing is a greater obstacle to the achievement of God's purpose in the world than the fact that every human being is dead in trespasses and sins, which means spiritually dead to the glory of God, which means nobody is born loving the glory of God above food or sex or power or family or anything else that they find pleasure in. Nobody sees. Everybody's blind. We're all corrupt. Blind and our fundamental disease called sin is a preference for other things rather than God. And the preference, um, this, is, this is a metronome, <clears throat> the preference is, is so strong you can't change it. It's called dead. That's scary. <laughs> God if your purpose is to magnify your glory in the white hot intensity of people in the enjoyment of you, that's not going to happen because they don't feel or see you as glorious. None of them. They're all dead. Now, that did not take God off guard. Nothing takes God off guard, right? God is never surprised. He sees and he knows everything that's coming. And he did before he made the world. Which means that our universal deadness didn't take him off guard. Which means that he folded it intentionally into his plan. Which means that my deadness and your deadness to the glory of God is not only an obstacle, but a means to the glorification of God. Because in a world that is fallen, God has unleashed by his engagement with the world a history of redemption, climaxing in the greatest event of history, in the incarnation of the Son of God, stretched out on a cross to die for the deliverance of the dead, the raising of the dead, the justification of the ungodly, and the pouring of the Holy Spirit into these horrid temples of rat-infested sin, that story gets God more glory than if there was never sin and never deadness. So he wasn't taken off guard. And the obstacle is not merely an obstacle. It is a means. Now, before I show you five ways the Bible is essential in that process, let's make sure you get the biblical foundation of what I just said. Because I don't know where you're coming from the theologically. Let's be really clear that all human beings are born dead. Dead to spiritual things. Dead to glory. That is, unable to see the glory of God in the face of Christ as irresistibly compelling. That's what I mean by dead. Unable to see it as irresistibly compelling. Nobody is born that way. You've got to be born again to see that, feel that, want that. Why do I say that? 1 Corinthians 2.14 
The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them. They are spiritually discerned, which means without the Holy Spirit, he can't discern the beauties of the things of the Spirit. Or Romans 8, 7 and 8. We'll look at this tomorrow morning. The mind of the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Or 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Apart from God's saving grace, not a single person in this room would find God attractive. No one. And if you don't find him attractive, more attractive than everything else, either you're in a spiritual slump or you're not born again. And I pray God would cause you to be born again by this word. Luther called this condition the bondage of the will. He said at the end of his life that was his most important book, the bondage of the will. But it's a bondage for which we are guilty. We're not guilty for all bondages. But this one we're guilty. We're responsible for this bondage. Even though we're morally and spiritually unable to prefer the beauty of God over the deceitful beauty of sin, we're guilty. And we're responsible, though unable. Because... This is not the kind of inability that takes away guilt and responsibility. It's the kind of inability that leaves it. Illustration. It's it's not this kind of inability. A person who is unable to see and love God never talks like this. I prefer God over all things, with all my heart, but something is stopping me from embracing him as my treasure. You wouldn't be guilty if that were true. That's not your bondage. Your bondage talks like this. I do not prefer God over this world and therefore I will not embrace him as my supreme treasure and that preference for the world is a guilty preference what that means is that you are dead or were dead morally unable to enjoy God, to treasure God above all things. And as a result of this deadness to the glory of God, so that we don't treasure it above all things, we commit high treason. That is, attempting to dethrone God from his place as the supreme treasure of the universe. Not preferring God over all things is treason against the king of the universe and attempt to dethrone him from his place as the supreme treasure of the universe. And it is a capital crime multiplied by infinity because he's infinite. And we deserve to go to hell for not preferring God above all things. And we will. Unless God does something. And he did. So the greatest obstacle to the purpose of God, remember what it was, 
to be glorified in the white hot intensity of the enjoyment of his people in himself in a broken and perfected world. That's the goal of God. It cannot succeed while people are dead in trespasses and sins and have no heart for God, no zeal for God, no love for God, no enjoyment of God, no satisfaction in God, no treasuring of God. It can't happen. Everything will abort. This universe is going to abort in its purpose if something doesn't give. And God gave. Ephesians 2, 4 is probably the best but God sentence in the Bible. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. That's how any of us came to love God, trust God, delight in God, be satisfied in God, treasure God, so that the purpose of God in the universe could happen. God said, I will raise them from the dead. And my question is, how does he do that? And my answer is, he does it by his inspired Inerrant scriptures, the words, words of God that make up the Bible. That's how he does it. Which is why this book is indispensable to the achievement of the purpose of God. The whole of God's eternal purpose, let it be said clearly now, the whole of God's eternal purpose to be glorified in the white hot worship of his people hangs on the truth of this book. Five ways. Here we go. Number one, there can be no fullness of joy in God where there's no fullness of revelation of God's excellencies. There can be no fullness of joy in God where there's no fullness of the revelation of the excellencies of God. That's what's in this book. It is a wonderful thing that God has revealed himself in nature. The heavens are telling the glory of God. But that revelation of the glory of God cannot compare to the knowledge we have of God in the history of salvation recorded in this book and only here with authority and absolute truth. 1 Samuel 3.21 describes how God reveals himself clearly. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel by, by the word of the Lord. You struck me with your word. And I loved you. That's a great sentence from Augustine. All God-exalting joy is based on God-revealed knowledge of God. And the fullness of God-exalting joy is possible only where there's fullness of revealed knowledge. And that's only here. This is what we need in order to achieve the purpose of God, to delight in God forever. Second, the story of how God acted in history to purchase and release us from spiritual deadness through Christ, through the new covenant, through the shedding of the blood and the resurrection, the story of how he delivered us from the bondage of our will and delivered us from the wrath of God, that story is recorded here. If you take the Bible away, we have no knowledge of that. All the knowledge you have today, even if it's not in the Bible, is derivative from the Bible. The point here in the second reason for why the Bible is essential is that God has ordained that the knowledge of himself come through a book. When I think of the phrase, look at the book, that's not chosen mainly because it rhymes. 
I have been stunned and shaped in my whole ministry by the amazing truth. He didn't do it with videos. He didn't do it with photographs. He did not do it with oral tradition. He didn't do it with audio recordings. And you might say, well, of course he didn't. They weren't invented. That's not a problem for God. <laughs> if he wanted to do it that way, just get them invented. Ezra invents a video record. <laughs> That's not a problem. I mean, seriously, this is not an accident. He chose a book. It's amazing. The implications are st- Staggering for the world, for education everywhere, for missions, for child rearing, for the precious gift of reading, for schools and churches. The implications that it's a book is staggering. That's, that's point number two on why the Bible is essential. God has chosen that the only way we'll have any authoritative access to the story that saves is in a book. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Number three, the third way that the book is essential to our eternal joy and God's eternal purpose is that without the miracle of new birth, without the miracle of new birth, nobody would see God as attractive and therefore nobody would enjoy him with white hot intensity and therefore God would not get the glory that he's after in our hearts and therefore the purpose of the universe would fail. So I want to know, how do people get born again? It isn't that they get born again through word alone or spirit alone. Here's 1 Peter 1.23. This is the most important passage, I think, on this issue. 1 Peter 1.23, you have been born again not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. And this is the Word that you heard, the good news that was preached to you. So notice two things from verse 23 and 25 of 1 Peter 1. The Word that is being spoken is the narration of the story of good news. The gospel of Jesus, death, resurrection, and the meaning of all those acts in the book. I don't like the tendency to limit the term word of God to a a little piece of the word of God called the gospel. Because the reason there's an inspired book is because all of its parts, especially that central part, is interpreted and made plain and powerful by all the other parts. This is no accidents in this book. This, this part right here, the part that nobody reads, <laughs> is important to make this part what God wants it to be. This wouldn't be here otherwise. He's God. He's not stupid. (laughs) Therefore, when I hear him say, this word is the good news that was preached to you, I know the gospel of Christ crucified and risen for sinners is at the center of that, and I'm going to push with all my might that without this book, that's not going to happen over time. We will lose it. We will lose the center if we throw away everything that was written to make it understandable and apply it appropriately and fill it out mightily. That's the first thing to observe in that text. The second thing to observe in that text is that the Word is the instrument by which the Spirit gives life. The Word is the instrument by which the Spirit gives life. Here it is. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but by the imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. Through, through. So the Bible, the gospel at the center, and the fullness of Scripture is the instrument through which the Holy Spirit raises you from the dead. 
gives you life, opens your eyes to see Christ as compellingly beautiful. That's the new birth. And it comes through the word of God. Once it was all boring, right? Nothing. You'd open this book, nothing. Confusing, silly, mythological. Can't make any sense out of it. Last thing you do is enjoy it. And then, what? You can't get enough of it. What happened? You were born again. You didn't make that happen. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's, nature's. I was by nature in the darkness of night. Thine eye diffused a quickening, life-giving ray. I woke the dungeon. Everybody's in a dungeon. The dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. That's called new birth. It happens by the Spirit of God through the Word of God. Or John Newton, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Only the Spirit through the Word makes that happen. James 1.18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. 2 Corinthians 4.6, God who said that light shine out of darkness has shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. In other words, when you open to people the scriptures and display Jesus Christ, its roots in the Old Testament, its fruits in the New Testament, its center in the cross, when you lay it out for people, God says, let there be light and people are born again with the book. Through the book, he shone in a heart and said, let there be light. So now we've seen three ways out of the five. We're getting there. We're almost done. Three ways. Here they are. The first way that the Bible is essential in achieving the ultimate goal of the universe and our ultimate joy in God is that there is no fullness of joy in God where there is no fullness of revelation of God. Number two. The story of God's deliverance of his people is only found with truth and authority and fullness in the book, and it must be known. Number three, the historical account of the saving work of Christ in all of its biblical context and ramifications is the instrument by which the Holy Spirit raises the dead. Two more. The joy of faith is created by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. When a child is raised from the dead, when you're born again, your first cry is, I trust you. And my point here is that faith that is created by the Word has joy in God as an essential component of it. And without that joy in God, the purpose of the universe cannot be achieved, and therefore the Bible through which faith comes is essential to the purpose of the universe. Let me just make a small case that joy in God is an essential part of faith in God. 2 Corinthians 1.24 Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy. They're almost interchangeable for Paul. They are interchangeable in that sentence. Faith and joy. Or Philippians 1.25. I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your joy of faith. Your joy permeated faith. Or the words of Jesus, John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. <clears throat> so what is believing? Believing is a coming to have your thirst quenched. 
Believing is a coming to have your hunger stilled. And Christ is the bread and Christ is the water. Therefore, where there's no coming to Christ for bread, for the soul, no coming to Christ for water, for the thirsty soul, no coming to Christ as a treasure for our miserly heart. We're not believing. We live in a day where so many people try to turn believing into an intellectual phenomenon by which you confess Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Savior. Well, the devil knows he's Lord, and the devil knows he's Savior. But you say, oh, but we receive him. Indeed. What does that mean? What does it mean, receive him? He came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but to as many as received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become the children of God. Receiving and believing are the same thing. What does receiving mean? Receiving what he is, who he is, and he is the supreme treasure in the universe. Therefore, where he is not received as what he is, he's not believed. So joy in him, treasuring him, delighting in him, being satisfied in him is the meaning of saving faith. It is an essential component of what it means to believe and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And therefore, if this book did not exist, there would be no faith and there would be no receiving of Jesus as the treasure that he is and therefore no supreme joy in him and therefore the purpose of the universe would fail. It's an important book. Lastly, number five, the Bible is essential to our joy and God's ultimate purpose because our faith and our joy are under attack every minute of every day from the flesh, the world, and the devil. As long as you live on this planet, you will be embattled until death or the second coming turn it all around. How do you win that battle? How do you wake up believing in the morning? I've asked so many people, what makes you think you will wake up, what is today, the 26th? What makes you think that you'll wake up on the 27th of September, 2014, and be a believer? Treasure Christ. What makes you think you will? There's one answer why you will. He keeps you. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before the throne of his glory with rejoicing. To him be glory, majesty, and authority forever. That's the only reason anybody wakes up a believer on the second day and the third and the fourth and the fifth and 68 years worth of waking up after being converted at age six. Amazing that John Piper is a Christian today. Absolutely off the charts glorious that I'm still a Christian. I cannot get over that I survived the ministry. <laughs> Are you amazed that you wake up a believer in the morning? You should be. You're not doing it. You're not creating that love. You're not creating those desires. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And my question is, how does he do it? You see where I'm going? How does he do it? Here's how he does it. Psalm 119, verse 36. Incline my heart to your testimonies, O God. I've prayed that a thousand times. Knowing that if he doesn't do that, I won't love the book. I love television. I love videos. I love sports. 
Incline my heart, O oh God. Here's the metronome. Push it. Push it. I can't push it. I can't. I don't have the power to make myself love anything. And the gravity of my life is always in the wrong direction. Without the Holy Spirit, I'm undone. We're going to see that tomorrow morning, beginning in Romans 7, why we need Romans 8 so bad. Incline my heart to your testimonies. My only hope is the book. Philippians 1.6, he will sustain you to the end. I mean, he will finish the work that he's begun. And how will he do it? John 20, 31. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you have life in his name. These are written that you may believe. We, we always, many of us use that verse for conversion. Yes, amen, that are written to convert people. But that's not what it says. It says, these things are written that you may believe. You got a belief issue in the morning? I got a belief issue every morning. These are written that I might believe at nine when I was wavering at seven. Every day, the battle rages. Are you a warrior or are you coasting? Nobody coasts to heaven. The current is all in the other direction. We swim or we're over the falls. We swim by the word. Here's another way to look at it. Holiness is essential for heaven. Hebrews 12, 14, strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Where does that come from? How does holiness happen in your life? Answer, John 17, 17, Jesus says, sanctify them. That is, make them holy in your truth. Your word is truth. There is no hope for holiness without the word. Jesus said, John 8, 32, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And in the context, free from what? Sin, meaning holiness is found in the word, through the word, by the spirit. We're saved by the spirit through the word. We're held on to by the Spirit through the Word. We're sanctified, made holy by the Spirit through the Word. Or here's 2 Peter 1, 4. He has granted us precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world. How do we escape from the corruption that is in the world? How do we share in the divine character? Answer, through precious and very great promises. How else can we live without daily doses of the blood-bought promises of Jesus? And all of them, old and new, are ours in Christ. Yes, in Christ. Holiness comes from feasting your eyes on Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 3.18, beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being changed from one degree of glory to the next. And how do you feast your eyes on the glory of Jesus? The Lord revealed himself to Samuel <coughs> through the word of God. I'll conclude with five statements of summary. The Bible is essential, indispensable for the achievement of the ultimate purposes of God in the universe because that ultimate purpose is for Him to be glorified in and through the white hot intensity of the everlasting enjoyment of His people in Himself, which cannot happen without this book. Therefore, the universe fails. God fails 
where this book is lost. It will not be lost. It will not be lost. The flower fades, the grass withers, and the word of our God will stand forever. Summary. Number one, the fullness of joy depends upon the fullness of revelation about God. He's given it to us. Number two, the fullness of this joy depends on the story of God's deliverance preserved in a book, not videos, a book for 2,000 years plus, 3,500 years plus. Third, the fullness of joy depends upon the actual individual new birth of people, and that happens by the Spirit through the Word. Number four, the fullness of joy depends upon saving faith, which comes by the Word, because faith includes being satisfied with all that God is for us in Jesus. And number five, the fullness of joy depends upon the perseverance of that faith and that holiness, and we will not have it unless we gaze upon the beauty of the Lord so that we become like Him and we gaze upon Him nowhere else with any confidence or authority except in the pages of this book. And therefore, the entire purpose of God in the universe hangs on the inspiration and authority and truthfulness of the Bible. These things have been spoken to you. Jesus said that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full, that the Trinitarian joy of the Father and the Son might move into our lives so that the intensity would reach a white-hot perfection in the last day and God would be glorified in us because we are fully and completely satisfied in Him. Which means that I pray that in this conference, the sweet words will rest upon you with a new weight of glory that say, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings from the honeycomb. So Father, Grant that any who is dead in this room, dead, unresponsive and unmoved by the glories of Christ in the book, would be made alive. And that the rest of us would be preserved and intensified in our joy in you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.